Okay. This meeting is being live streamed. Okay. Hey, we made it to Facebook. Woo! Yay. <laughs> Yay. And I finally managed a very low computer skill roll to get something rolling here. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. This is Trisha Clay, and I'm the director of registration with MEPICON. And I'm so excited to hopefully see lots and lots of you in person in November. But for right now, we're online. Uh, so that's me. Min, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Men Kreiner, co-founder of Carcosa Creations. I am also the assistant lead storyteller for the official By Night Studios Discord LARP, Miami By Night. Thanks, man. That was a whole, a whole like grown introduction. It was beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that, Megan. How about we go to you next? <laughs> My name is Megan Levine. Uh, I am still caffeinating this morning. Preferred pronouns being she, her, please. Um, I am the founder of Elder Entertainment, a LARP and RPG group, uh, focuses mostly, mostly on Call of Cthulhu at a bunch of local cons. Uh, in my real life times, I am also the director of a community center um, that focuses on empowering children who um, generally are uh, underserved in their communities. So I get to come at this from a bunch of different directions. Fantastic. Bridget, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, family. My name is Bridget Jeffries. Uh, I am the owner and founder of Symphony Entertainment, which is a gaming club and company based on all things horror, tabletop role-playing games. So Dread, Call of Cthulhu, Cthulhu Dark, Cult, Alien, the RPG, all that fun stuff uh, we dig into in Symphony. Uh, I am also the newest co-host of the Miskatonic University podcast, two-time Emmy Award winning. You can check that out at mu-podcast.com. And last but certainly not least, I am the newest, sorry, uh, my struggle has been struggling since like Thursday, sorry. I am the newest Chaosium uh, community ambassador uh, supporting the Miskatonic University. So if you're looking to create and self-publish your seventh edition Call of Cthulhu scenario, uh, holler at me. And uh, be on the lookout for Jasmine because I am going to be chasing her down all the way until she gets both of her scenarios on the repository. Yes. <laughs> <Anyone take? laughs> Segway to Jasmine. Hi, I'm Jasmine. I'm on, I guess, Bridget, if you love me to say I was part of Symphony. And... A proud member of Symphony. We are grateful Hell to have yes. you. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. And, and I think we were talking about this yesterday that I'm probably going to be a Mepicon volunteer with Katie. And be the map of bird, answer all your questions. I'm on the whole Cthulhu discords that I can find. <laughs> yeah, that's it for me, I guess. And she's a great no, keeper, you're... and she's a great writer, and she's a great creator. Just throwing that all out there, too. Just and there. also one of the amazing keepers of the cult of chaos with Chaosium. Woo, Can't forget woo. that. It's important. Don't sell yourself short. Exactly. Jasmine is our uh, Mepicon GM extraordinaire. And we couldn't do it without her. So to get this ball rolling here, let's talk a little bit about how we all got involved in the gaming community. Who would like to start with that one? All right, I'll, I'll go in. first. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead. Go, for it. go for it, No, you go first. Um, so I will make this as succinct as possible because it's a long story, but I got put into detention in high school and while sitting in detention, my AP calculus teacher started drawing game maps on his whiteboard and I'm Ooh. nosy and I started asking a bunch of questions and that turned into me asking questions week after week after week after week until he actually invited me to his basement uh, to start playing advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So I started in That's high school amazing. because I talked too much. <laughs> That's amazing. That is a fantastic <laughs> story. I love that story. Thanks, babe. <laughs> Megan? Sure. Um, so I got into it again, also in high school, um, because I went to a high school with like 60 people in my class uh, and everything overlapped. So the nerdy kids were also the gaming kids, which were also the theater kids, which were also the kids in AP classes. Uh, so everything just kind of like shoved in <laughs> together. Uh, so I got into theater, which means by default, I met all the nerdy gamer kids. 
Uh, and actually, I did this completely the wrong way around for most gamers. I LARPed before I RPG'd. Um, nice. I got shoved into it with LARP um, into a group that had several, uh, like several iterations all across the country. And I got shoved into national level plot on my first night, <laughs> my first LARP ever. Uh, wow. And I was addicted to it. So I've been doing it since. That is amazing. And now you're like leading the region in most popular marks. That is awesome. Oh, That's fantastic. I'm, I'm enjoying our love fest here, guys. This is great. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> love me, love me, love me. How about, how about uh, Min? I actually have a lot more personal of a story for how I got into gaming because it ties directly into Mepicon. Uh, the person that I had met at the time, I. Uh, convinced me if just barely to try this you know new and strange world out and I wide-eyed and innocent walked into my very first Mepicon in fall of 2008. So I have been going to Mepicon and have not missed a Mepicon since then because I got hooked and that is actually the real start of my love for gaming was Mepicon itself and yeah uh, needless to say, because MEPA is my home con, it means a lot to me. And wow, I'm getting myself choked up. So let's go on to Jasmine. <laughs> okay. Related to Megan, I was in, I, I um, while I was in college, my, my major was theater. So one of the, the direct the student directors was a DM for third edition, and he invited me to play. And that's way back in 2005. And I think around that time, I went to MEPACon once. And then didn't go back for like another like 10 years or something like that. But yeah, I started way back in 2005, third edition D&D. &D, and I th nice. think I, my first game of Cthulhu was way back in around 2013 or 14 with Kevin. Nice. I love how she says way back in 2005 back. because. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I actually started gaming in college, which I think is the same college, Jasmine. Um, but many, 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 many years before that. So I, I had a roommate and I had a boyfriend and my boyfriend was a gamer. And my roommate said to me, oh, it's great. You'll love it. The guys go and game and we can stay at back and study. And I was like, uh, that's not sounding fun to me. So um, I actually got invited to go watch a game, which was um, Twilight 2000. And I was sitting there for about five minutes before my dear friend, Chris, who often comes to Mepicon, was like, hey, why don't you roll up a character? And um, I ended up rolling up the highest ranked character. I outranked all the guys <laughs> who were actually in the military. It was, yeah. Yeah. I eventually had to in-game threaten somebody to shoot them in the head because they weren't listening to me. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fun time, I, dude. I say two thousand and I say two thousand and five as my official RPG. If we want to go technical, nineteen ninety eight when I was in musical freeform RPGs. Cool. So. Now this was, I think, nineteen eighty eight. So yeah, long, low, many years ago. And then um, we started, we, I shouldn't say we, I was there, but I didn't do the, do the starting. That was uh, Ed Lehman. But I was there on day one in Wind Gap on our first one day event. And then here we are doing another one day, but online. So, you know, wow, things really roll around and it'll be our 41st con in November. So wow. congrats. Yeah, thanks. So and Trish, let's face it, it was a we. It always was a we. I mean, yes, Ed may have given birth to Mepicon, but you have always been part of its heart and soul. So please don't sell yourself short either. Uh, thanks, man. You're welcome. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know what? One of my favorite, favorite, I say this heavily sarcastically, questions was somebody said to me, hey, do you ever actually play games? Why are you even here? I was like, wow. Oh, Ooh. wow. So wow. speaking of not being like inclusive and nice. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's a segue right into the topic. I was like, well, yeah, you know, somebody has to take the registrations. 
uh, yeah, so. I imagine every single like femme presenting person has a story exactly like that. Um, it, you know, it's not always, gaming has not always been kind uh, nope. in general to those of us who, who do femme present. So yeah, I think we probably all have that story. Yeah, in some form or fashion. Yes. Okay, probably, especially those of us who are storytellers. I know I certainly do. I know this wasn't our, one of our questions, but as long as we're talking. No, go um, for it. So I, I am the storyteller for our group. Uh, and if anyone is, ever like sits in our house, tonight is our, our usual RPG night. They sit in our house and they look at us and it's me and eight guys. <laughs> you know, eight dudes. Right. And I'm the one in charge. And people don't expect that. Um, when we go to con settings, likewise, like my husband... Uh, is another founding member of Elder Entertainment, but he primarily is support. He does set up and tear down. He does. He is not a storyteller. He will tell you straight up himself. Um, so generally, if someone comes in and has a question about the game, they should be coming to me as a storyteller. Right. Uh, and almost inevitably to a person, whether it's staff at a convention, whether it's people wanting to know when the game starts, whatever, they walk in the room, they walk straight to my husband. Your husband also happy. is a wonderful giant and very, is. very visible. He is very visible. Um, but it's always fantastic when they go straight to him and start asking him questions. And he just like turns and points at me and says, she's in charge. Go to her. Um, this actually happened once at a con. I was setting up. I'm at the table by myself with a stack of books and a bunch of character sheets. And I'm setting up everything in front of me. I'm getting the Jenga tower going because we're doing thread. And... I'm setting everything up. And you know, if you're looking at this tableau, it could just be entitled Storyteller Preparing. Right. But <laughs> dude walks in, looks at the table and says, hey, do you know when the storyteller is going to get here? I have some questions. I'm like, well, maybe I could help. He says, no, I think I'll just wait until he arrives. Wow. <sighs> and that happens all the time. You know? So again, wow. one of those things about being more inclusive is not making assumptions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And che checking our biases. I mean, I, I think we've all had that moment where we were looking for a dude for whatever reason, you know, that's, or, or looking for somebody who looks like what I expect that person to look like, whatever that might be. Um, and many, so many times we're wrong, but yeah, I mean, that's a kind heavy context clues this person is setting up the table why would she not be the storyteller she's setting up the table actually um to kind of segue off of what megan just said with that i had a feeling that i was going to be running into that when kevin and i founded kirkosa creations so one of the first things that I insisted on after we figured out our logo is that I wanted to actually have proper shirts with our logo and it's right across, you know, my chest so that people know I am part of what's running this. And I've noticed that if I don't have on my staff shirt and I am, you know, wearing whatever I need to for an NPC. I have had players specifically, typically male presenting players, not take what I say as seriously and look for my husband. Yeah. And bias is absolutely there. And that's something that I have to actively work against when I am in the process of running a scene. Now, one of the things that I could speak to from my experiences online, conversely, is because I go by men and I very specifically all over the BNS discord have my pronouns as they, them. I am taken more seriously as an assistant lead storyteller. People will respect what I say more until they ever go into a voice call with me and hear that my voice is femme presenting. And then I sometimes have issues and it's not consistent. It's not a, it's not a conscious thing that I've noticed like very specifically with people but there is a difference and it's one of the things that as a storyteller I try to distract people from you know focusing too much on who I am 
and more who the story, what the story is, um, to try and get around said biases and maybe make them through, through story confront their own biases just a little bit, make them question and make them grow. I don't yeah, know I about anybody else, great. but I, I noticed when I was thinking about when we were talking the other day that way when I and Gavin were putting together the meetup group, it was more male presenting people. Now it's more slowly getting into, you know, everybody's a little bit of mix. And even my Wednesday night game, we're, we're outnumbering the guys, you know, so. Yep, it's little a by little. <laughs> hearing these stories. Um, I remember early days when I was attending Origins, that very first year I ran through, I'll say maybe once a day, possibly twice a day, I would sit down at a table. And the second I sat down, presented my ticket, I would immediately start getting ambushed with mansplaining. I remember sitting at a, a shadow, help me guys, shadow, shadow. Shadow run. Shadow run. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. You're I welcome. Need more light. Thank you. Uh, shadow run game. And I pulled my dice out, sat at the table, and you know the the GM said, "Hey, you know, does anybody new to Shadow Run?" I was like, "Yeah, I'm new. This is a two hour introductory game. Just wanted to get a taste for it." And both of the guys on my right and my left zoomed in on me. It's like, "All right, open up your dice bag, and we're going to show you what a D4 is, and a D6 is, and a D8 mm -hmm. is." It's like, um. Uh -huh. No, I don't actually need, and no, no, thank you, thank you. Okay, well, here's your character sheet. And okay, so strength is like how strong you are. I can, babe, thank you. I got, I got it, I got it, I got it. So the second year I went to Origins, and actually as I started picking up going into gaming cons, I would always do what men is doing right now, like putting some type of banner on myself to immediately circumvent that, hey guys, I belong here. So I would always wear a D20 choke collar, or D6 earrings, or some type of a nerdy shirt, just to try to get in front of the, oh, hi, you're a black female, so obviously you've never played a game before. Let me sit here and explain to you the basics of dice. No, babe, I don't, babe, <laughs> Jesus. So <laughs> as I've progressed, uh, my effort has increased <laughs> significantly, and now I don't feel the need to visibly present myself as a relevant or an applicable gamer anymore. But my early stages, that was hard. I was like, I, okay, what am I gonna wear today? So when I sit down at tables, people realize I actually do belong here. Wow, that's that's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think like Megan is explaining, I gamed with the guy. I was the only woman at the table for most, for many years, many, many, many years. And then we started to pick up um, partners of the group. And of course, Mapicon meant that I met a lot of women who, who game and, and, you know, playing with Jasmine and, and playing with men. And, you know, I mean, I never thought like a man has to be the, the game master or the storyteller. I never had that in my head, but it does help you when you see more, when, when you're seeing more women, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and like a Bridget said, I hope we're getting to the point where it doesn't have to be like, I have some sort of clothing on, although I always have my staff shirt on. So maybe that helps, you know, I belong here. Look at my shirt. Um, maybe that helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I, think, I agree you know, with you on it. yeah, I think, you know, I love that we're trying to do things to help people learn, right? But in what what does being inclusive mean to you if you're running a, it, it, let's say if you're now, because we talked a little bit about our specific experiences, but like at the table or in the game room, what does being inclusive mean to you guys? Perfect world it having everybody at the table and then having them represented in the characters if that makes sense yeah i um related to issue to your question trisha and I'll, then i'll um a couple about a month ago we were had i had one shot for call of Cthulhu with kevin and one other player who was female presenting and i listed three characters two were male and one was female and the one female player was like i can't play a male i'm not allowed to so it was like oh we had oh, to wow. go into a whole conversation. You're allowed to play a male character if you wanted to, you know. 
Yeah. Oof. Well, I'm glad you were able to help that player because mm-hmm. that's really, really, really important. Yeah. It's so important. Mm-hmm. And um, going off of what Jasmine just said with that is that as a storyteller, whether with Carcosa, whether with mm-hmm. By Night Studios, whether with Elder Entertainment, when Kevin and I run with Elder Entertainment, we want to make sure that as GMs, we not only have the table be welcoming and that no one ever has been made to feel like I've felt at tables before. That's my biggest goal, is I want everyone to feel welcome at home. And my biggest and most important thing is not how the plot goes is not how if things end the way I think they should. It's for my players to have a good time. And not only for my players to have a good time, but for them to have it as an experience that hopefully they treasure and remember. And if I'm able to do that by making them feel welcome at my table and safe, because we deal with themes of horror, we deal with themes of existential horror, dread, and all these other really difficult topics. And to do that safely, sensitively and in a way that the player can still have fun while their characters have absolutely lost their sanity it's difficult it's a difficult balancing act and one of the other things that i also typically like to use and i know elder entertainment does this as well is if there is a character that unless there is a very 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 specific story based reason we are like you want this person to be gender non-conforming, go for it. Make it work with the, sto- with the story and tweak what you need to. Once we put that character sheet in your hands, you are the character. Mm-hmm. You are the one that is in control and you can make your character be who you want them to be. Especially as someone who is, you know, gender non-conforming, gender queer with my presentation, I particularly like that because there are days where I'm feeling more masculine and I don't want to touch anything that has a feminine tint to it. Mm -hmm. There are days where, yeah, I'll play up my femme side. Let's go for it. And there's the rest of the days where I just want to be my eldritch horror self and cause people sanity loss. And that works (laughs) too. And I want that same flexibility for my players so that they feel just as comfortable. And I think that's what inclusivity inclusivity really is all about so that people are happy comfortable and safe above anything else well said very well said yeah and now i'm gonna end up blushing thanks (laughs) um i think for me inclusivity looks purposeful um that's that's where it has to start it has to start before you even get to the table because you're thinking about characters ahead of time and you're thinking about, is this going to be problematic? You know, uh, you're thinking about the story, the content and the material, and is this going to be problematic? And let's be honest, you know, with Elder Entertainment, we love Lovecraft. You know, we do primarily Call of Cthulhu. That's most of what we do. I ran one Call of Cthulhu game, my first Gen Con like 12 years ago, and people said, you can't stop doing this. So it's what I do. Um, And Lovecraft, has got some shit going on, mm-hmm. you guys. Like, yeah, it's right. We talk about it all the time. Yup. Racism, misogyny, like xenophobia, like it's all in there and it's problematic. And, you know, for me, making Lovecraft inclusive is hard um, because you have to be purposeful and intentional up front. You have to look at it in its face and you have to say, this is a problem and you have to take things out. And even more, you have to put things in, you know? Right. Um, Absolutely. So when we're building, we're building Lovecraft scenarios that address racism. Um, we did one a few years ago when the previous administration was still in place that was set on the Mexican American border wall uh, and dealt with disconnects between people on either side. You know, we've set games in the Civil War, uh, we've set games in World War One, um, World War Two. Like we we've dealt with some really big stuff. Um, while using Cthulhu, which is you know, kind of interesting. Uh, so giving inclusivity for us is, is purposeful, it's intentional, it's ahead of time, 
Uh, and it's giving people the space to deal mm -hmm. with real world stuff uh, in a way and in a place that's safe, um, that they know that they can trust. Um, it's also given people an out. Um, yes. Kevin, or, uh, men kind of hinted at this. One of the things we do in elder entertainment is we have what's called our Kiwi. Um, so our Kiwi is our, it's our pause button. If you as a player, not as a character, we want characters to go crazy, but if you as a player are feeling like, I don't like where this is going, I'm becoming uncomfortable. Um, that Kiwi, you know, you say it in a LARP setting, it's like, say, say Kiwi, you pause, we pause that scene, you step away, somebody's gonna check on you and say, what's going on? How can we help? Do we want to reintegrate? Do we want to nix this all together? Do we want to try and step back in? Do you feel like you just need to nope out of the game? And that's fine too. Uh, it's giving people that space to, to say when they're uncomfortable because we can't, as, as you, we can't experience everyone's lives. We can't know everyone's feelings and, uh, right. and traumas. All we can do is give people the space to, to work through those as they want to, if they want to. Mm -hmm. Yes, my bit is inclusivity is, is purposeful and intentional. Yes. And That's Kiwi is an incredible safety tool. And we are very, very happy to also have Kiwi as part of Carcosa Creations because Megan, I know how influential you were on Kevin and we keep that the same because, you know, you know, our history. <laughs> One less thing to remember. <laughs> And also it works. Safety tools matter. Yeah, I think that's great. And I know when way back in the day when I first started gaming, there was no no conversation mm -hmm. about anything like that. I mean, I mean, I mostly played at home with close friends. And so, so we worked around it in other interpersonal ways, but that's really important in a, in a, con or a place anywhere that you're going to be bringing in people that you don't know well to be honest I think it's important when you do know the people because you might not realize right. what's a trigger or what's problematic for those those uh -huh. folks I've definitely been on the the other side where I didn't really know the people where something happened and I was just too awkward to say hey this is an issue yeah, well yeah. that's hard that's a difficult thing to do. Bridget, did you have something you wanted to share about that? Yeah, I was um, just thinking about a definition of inclusivity that I come across. I actually put it up on my phone and uh, inclusion is the practice of providing everyone with equal access and opportunities and resources. So I was thinking about that at any table that I'm running for symphony or when I start onboarding GM, something I'm gonna be very intentional. Uh, like Megan just said, it, it begins on the front end before you even sit down at the table. But when you're looking at inclusivity from the table from Bridget's attack point, it's making every person at the table feel seen. It's making every person at the table, giving them an opportunity to shine. It's making every person at the table feel safe and knowing that it is a group effort. We're all in this together. Um, to make sure you walk off the table having a good time. So I have played with different gender presenting people. I have run for individuals that were visually impaired. I have run with people with speech impediments. And you can see sometimes that, and it's almost human nature. Like if, if you're coming to the table, it's like, I don't want to be an inconvenience because you're going to have to take an extra step to accommodate me in this way. No, you're not an inconvenience. You belong here. I want you here. And we're going to take that extra step. Is there any other steps we need to take to make sure you're having the best time possible? Awesome. Let's rock out from there. So I think from an inclusive inclusivity standpoint, for me, it's in the moment, at the time, ground zero. What can we do to make sure that you feel safe, that you feel comfortable, that you feel supportive, and that you matter at the table? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's really, really well said, Bridget. Yeah, I think Thanks, that's baby. great. That is great. Um, and I'm thinking about what Jasmine was saying about being at the table and feeling awkward. Um, and there's there's an issue. I'm just thinking of, there's a lot, I've played with a lot of people over time who are more shy <laughs> and they don't necessarily get the, you know, blockbuster, you know, center stage uh, plot point 
And I know some people that don't want to be in the center stage mm-hmm. plot point and others that might, ju- I want to be there, but I don't know how to accomplish it because I'm a shy, awkward person or I'm awkward in this situation, right? Um, what are some tactics that you, you all think of that can help with that? Megan, do you want to start off on this one? Because I have a feeling I know where you're going to go with this one. (laughs) Um, so again, man, I just keep coming back to like pre-planning and intentionality, um, in a con setting where you're the one building the character sheets, there's this amazing ability for you to make sure that every character has something that is uniquely them. And when you are building the scenario, to be able to include a point where that person's one thing that is only for them is going to be a key point. And it doesn't have to be a huge character thing. It doesn't have to be a gigantic part of the story, but by the end of it, you know, as storytellers, we have this amazing ability to put the puzzle pieces on the table and then to make sure they're gonna fit into the big picture. Uh, And to make sure that person has their moment where they are they are the star. Even if they don't star in it, they are the key. It's got to turn for the next thing to go. Um, and that's a spectacular uh, gift to us as storytellers to share that with other people. Um, one of the other things I love, even if you're not the one writing the character sheets. Um, so we do a lot of dread with Elder Entertainment. People love dread. And the great thing about dread for those who have not played so uh, most of the time you use dice, you know, a lot of times in RPGs, dread is a Jenga tower, okay? That you pull pieces out bit by bit, everything you would normally roll dice to do, instead you're pulling Jenga pieces to do. And if the tower falls, your character dies. Stop mm-hmm. in the story, dead. Um, so it's a lot of fun, but dread character sheets are unique in that all they are is a series of questions. There's no numbers, there's no skills. It is just a series of questions, open-ended, that you write your answers to. Uh, And it, for players, it's a bit of a challenge because they're like, well, I want to do this thing. I want to try this skill. Do I have it? And I'm like, I don't know. Did you write it in your character sheet? You know, (laughs) you jump across a chasm. Did you know that you did track in high school? Okay, let's go. So it's a bit of a challenge. Um, But the other great thing about it is people put things in there. Um, and your job as a storyteller is to go back and look at those sheets and pull out absolutely everything they put in. Everything is an opportunity. It can be the smallest little line, but it's an opportunity to do something spectacular later on, to challenge them, to encourage them. Like my husband's whole role when we do dread is just to whisper in people's ears. <laughs> he looks at the character sheet, the things they're afraid of, the things they're excited about, their goals, their hopes. And his whole job while I'm telling the story is to go to people and be like, hey, you know that that fear of cats? That's a problem right now. Like that's his whole job. <laughs> people love it because the I, people who don't want to be right up front and in the middle of it get to get pulled aside with him to deal with small things. Storytelling in pairs is great that way. Um, and, but yeah, take absolutely anything that somebody puts on that character sheet and pulling it into the moment is the best way to make sure people feel like they have that opportunity to be part of it. And I had a feeling you were going to segue right into what I was going to be bringing up, Megan. Uh, For live games in particular, though, it still is applicable in a online format. You just have to watch a little bit more carefully, especially uh, like with the Miami by Night game being text-based. Watch and see who's not speaking up as much. Watch and see how people's body reactions are, who looks like they're a bit unsure, who looks like they're a bit out of their element, so to speak. And going from there and finding a way to draw them in, even if it's something that you might not have necessarily planned in a moment, um, but still finding a way to go ahead and bring them in and draw them in further and say, hey, you know, you just noticed something going on that no one else did. Now, what are you going to do with that information? How are you going to use that? And if there's a player who is unsure 
I absolutely will go ahead and I will give suggestions. We always say right at the opening of any Carcosa Creations game, if you need suggestions for things, don't worry, just ask us. We have plenty of ideas. <laughs> and we say it in that exact same tone so people know we love to give ideas. And we love to give the little nudges, the little pushes that go ahead and help a person feel more at ease within the game itself, even if they are unsure of themselves or their own ability. And being able to act on the fly like that, besides prepping it in from the front end, I think is the second half of the really twofold way of making sure that everybody gets their moment to shine, just like Bridget had brought up. Everybody gets their moment in the spotlight, their moment in the sun, where people are like, wow, that's really awesome. And it's a moment that you have that can sear into your memory with a game, with something that just one particular player did that you never forget. And we have, we have memes of those moments for Carcosa. I mean, I know people will know ya boy <laughs> because that's for now sure. a running joke for a few years now. And there's those little moments that just build up and treasure into these amazing gaming stories that we have not only as storytellers, but our players also have so that they could say, oh, I remember this game. Oh, I remember this. And those moments are, I think, some of the most beautiful things about inclusivity because they were involved, they were included, and now they have that moment to treasure. And honestly, that's one of the things that gets me the happiest as a storyteller. That's what I love. That's why I do this. Right. And you've built... I think what we're talking about here is really building a community where people feel valued and they can try, they can try on different ways of being safely right in through role-playing or through live role-playing that no one it's your character, right? So if it doesn't work out exactly the way you want it, you know, I mean, probably we should be more like this in regular day to day life anyway, but yeah, you know, we try I agree. things out, but, but I think it's a great opportunity. And just as kind of a note tag team on what men said really beautifully, by the way, babe, oh. um, <laughs> when you're dealing with role-playing games, we're all in a place of vulnerability. We're stepping out of our sleeves in so many different areas, whether it's geographically, racially, sexually. I mean, there's just so many different ways that we're jumping out of our skin. So we're all coming to the table with a certain degree of vulnerability. And I think the one thing that men said, again, just so beautifully is, remember how you make people feel. People may or may not remember how cool that dragon was or how deadly that room was or how creepy the vampire was, but they will walk away from the table remembering how you made them feel, how you made them feel as a person, how you made them feel as, a, as they were role playing their character. And I think that's really important just to step back and always think about the humanity in that. Because when you're in those moments and you're in a vulnerable space, you as a storyteller, the keeper, the GM, you have so much influence over the table on how you make them feel. So one thing I'm obnoxious for, and Jasmine will probably attest to this, I'm really big on positive affirmations. If you said a funny one-liner, I'm going to acknowledge that shit. If you made a decision that was completely off the walls and it was brilliant, I'm going to tell you how brilliant that was. It doesn't matter if I'm sitting at the table next to you or if I'm the one at the head of the table. If you did something amazing, I'm going to stop and acknowledge it um, because I know how that feels when someone goes, wow, you know, it's not just, oh, cool, you roll a 20. It's, whoa, you really took me off guard with that question. I have to step back and actually consider that. How you make people feel at the table is really important. Um, Bridget, er, er, yeah, and going off of Bridget with that, um, one of the things that I absolutely adore for Miami by Night is we have two channels on the Discord servers one for circle of love and quotes out of context <laughs> and circle of love is just 
it's very self-explanatory where if somebody does something really amazing that either we catch as storytellers and narrators or other players catch, we go ahead and we say, especially like after really intense scenes, thank you for such a really powerful moving scene. That was absolutely amazing. And making sure that the player gets recognition for that. And then also with some of the more zany comments that we've had come up, quotes out of context is an absolute field day of just innuendos and really really awkwardly worded sentences <laughs> that, I, I th- when I you take I, them out of context oh boy i think i, I have a, a book of bridget quotes out of context right now <laughs> <laughs> probably I, yeah yeah probably 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 <laughs> that's great Something else Elder Entertainment is purposeful about is at the end of every game, um, you know, we have our circle time. <laughs> Maybe it's because I work with kids, but we all get together for happy circle time. Hey, there's nothing uh, wrong with like, circle time. <laughs> great. Because you can do that in the middle of a game. It is important to pause and acknowledge like, ah, oh, that was funny. That was great. And then there's the ability to do it in a structured way afterwards. Uh, and some of our games at, say, Gen Con, our Saturday night LARP will get to 50 people. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Oh, yeah, they're huge. But it doesn't matter if it's five people or it's 50 people. We're all getting together afterwards and sitting in a circle. Everybody gets to go around and they tell their characters dark secrets or their characters like thing that they were working toward that no one knew about. So again, it goes back to how you pull everybody in so everybody gets their moment. Their moment may not come till the end of the game, but then it's like, oh, when I was doing that with you, what I was actually doing was, and people get to feel excited but the other thing they have to do, they get to talk about their character for a moment and then they have to point out someone else, like some other great interaction or scene they had with someone. Yeah. So they're sharing how other people were doing and what other people were uh, were engaging in with them. And it gives a chance to do all that, that back and forth of love and, uh, and building of community. Because we have people who've been playing with us since our first year there 12 years ago. And yeah. the reason they keep coming back is those connections and those funny moments and the stories afterwards um, that really pull people together and make them feel welcome. Your boy was a wrap up moment for Carcosa. That was absolutely during our wrap up circle where one of our players, Ashley, she forgot how to say Naharlatep and just <laughs> literally went and pointed at the player who was playing to Harlotep for us and went, ya boy over there. <laughs> and ya boy to Harlotep became a thing. <laughs> and it has persisted for, I'm not kidding, five plus years after the fact because of how impactful that moment was. And it was just in a wrap up. And sometimes as a storyteller, especially because when you're managing a room of 20, 30, 40 plus people, even if there's multiple of you, you're going to miss a lot of the amazing moments. You're absolutely going to miss a lot of the incredible moments of role play that your players can give. And during that wrap up circle, it's where I get to hear all the little things and see the interactions, especially after somebody finds out a really big reveal. Like a player is like, oh, well, I was actually doing this all the time. The looks of shock <laughs> and horror mm-hmm. every time without fail, every time. Those are some of the best moments. The moments that I absolutely positively live for at the end of a game. And everything always ends on such a beautiful high note with everybody talking about those moments as they walk out my door, smiling and laughing. And that, that is the best gift that I can have as a storyteller are those smiles, those peals of laughter. And it's, I'll be honest, it's a runner's high. It's absolutely a freaking drug. And there's sometimes where I am giggling like a maniac afterward because of how amazing it makes me feel because of compersion. And yeah, that's, Oh, it's so wonderful. <laughs> to be honest, we're all storytellers because we all have a little exhibitionist streak. I mean, it's okay. Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so what? I sense that you had something you wanted to share, Jasmine. I was just going to say, like, every time that Min has a LARP, I have secondhand, like, stories from Megan and Ashley all the time. And same thing with, like, Bridget. I, I'll hear secondhand stories from people, and it's like, 
just the stuff that you guys get into is hilarious. Thank you. Well, and that's, that's, that's the great thing here, right? I mean, it's not only did we make a great experience for the people in the room, right? But we built this community. Now those people feel great. They go out, they talk to their friends about, oh, we had this great experience. I mean, I think that really has the power. I mean, that's what I love about, about Mepicon is that, you know, I see men's players come out and Jasmine's players and, you know, every, Oh, we just did this thing. Oh, this was great. Oh, I, or, or somebody's running out on a break to like grab a drink really quick. And they're like, I had to get back to the table because you know, whatever we, something is has to be, but I have to go into the bathroom or whatever it is. Um, so we've talked about all these really great, wonderful, positive, intentional things, but I do want to make sure that we cover the, what do we do when somebody or somebody's can't uphold the code of conduct, you know, or it has some problematic interaction at mm-hmm. the table. What do we what can we all do to make that shut that down, make it better, bring the person around? I'm open. I, I, I think it's really important to cover that. Agreed. I, I haven't had an in-person problem since whenever that time with Kevin and the, the, players I've had this year and men will and Bridget know who exactly who I'm talking about. I just went immediately to staff or to the, the GM and said, Hey, look, I've had this pl- problem with this person. Here's why. And then it was just dealt with immediately. You know, but there's steps that can definitely be taken as a storyteller, GM keeper, however you want to put it, that, you should take before um, hopefully needing to reach out to your convention staff. The biggest thing that I try to do is I try to see first and foremost, is this a case of understanding where an education moment is needed? Mm -hmm. That is, that is the place that I come from when I am trying to evaluate. Is this a, a person's having a technical issue, especially with the past year and a half that we've had, because there have been technical issues where people have ended up speaking over each other, not realizing it. And it was because of an issue with Zoom, an issue with Discord. And it's something that's very easily fixed and not actually meant to be as severe of an issue as it ended up being within the gameplay itself. Mm-hmm. That being said, that's not always the case. When it goes beyond it being possibly a teaching moment, then one of the hardest things you have to do as a GM, especially as someone uh, like me who is partially femme presenting, Mm -hmm. is to step up and say no. Because culturally speaking, and especially with how I was raised, I was raised to always make sure that everyone else around me was happy. I was raised to be a people pleaser. And I was raised that saying no was impolite. And getting over that supposed impoliteness to be able to say no, that is not okay. And to be firm yet fair about it is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And I've had to do it several times, both in Carcosa and with By Night Studios. And it's some of the hardest things that I've ever had to do. Because above all else, I want people to be having fun. Mm -hmm. And no is not a fun word. Right. No means that there is. It's hard doing it. It is very hard doing it. It is very difficult doing it. But using that no and knowing that those two letters offer a lot of protection to other people who will not be stepping up and able to say no themselves personally is how I find the strength to do it. Because if I don't say no, that is not okay. 
that means that one of my players might be thinking it and not able to say it, afraid to say it, even with the safety things that we have in place within the game, even with the restrictions, the lines, the X cards, the safe words, Kiwi, there's going to be moments where you just freeze and you can't get your voice out of your throat or get it to come out of your fingertips and on that keyboard or even hit enter to say it. Right. And I, as a storyteller, it is my responsibility to be able to use that no carefully and within reason and with discussion, not just a blanket no, a talking, a conversation that is not one-sided to make sure that both sides understand what's going on. Now, if that no doesn't work, then I reach out to convention staff because then it is going, okay, you are not listening to me and my authority as a GM. That means that you are a possibility of a risk to my players. And that means I need to notify convention staff about you. And there have been conversations that I have had to have with multiple convention staffs, whether it's from in-person or online, that I have had to put a boundary and say no, because that is the safer thing to do for inclusivity. Because inclusivity is not just making sure that everybody feels fit in and belong. It's also that everybody feels safe. And the reality is, is not everyone is necessarily safe. And sometimes keeping people who would be harmful out is better for inclusivity and is one of the hardest things you have to do. I just have Min's Min's answer forever time. (laughs) And now you got me blushing. (laughs) (laughs) Just Min's answer for all time. Thank you. So I approach... Um, I approach the, what do you do in this situation from two different angles? Uh, one, I'm really big on something called a temperature check. If things are getting heating on the table, whether it's in character, out of character, if things are getting super tense, if things are moving really fast, I will immediately go, all right, hey, uh, temperature check. Everyone. Okay. Look at me. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs down. I do it online. I do it in person. And that way I can quickly do a scope on how everyone is feeling across the table. They're not super interruptive, but if, um, I don't know, if men and Megan are arguing in character and like, you know, it's getting really tense and they've gone all the way to LARP mode and they're da 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 I will interrupt a mid-argument. Ah, temperature check. Y'all both okay? Table, y'all okay? Okay, great. That's a great way to just get a feeler out to figure out how your table is doing. The second thing, and I learned this the hard way, but now it's like my absolute favorite thing ever. When boundaries are being crossed, opinions are clashing and things are getting heated, immediately calling a break is one of the yes. sexiest things you can do. And I do mean, don't let it go. Don't let it ride. Just da 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 All right. Hey, awesome. We're going to take a five minute break right now. Everyone disperse. Get off yes. the table, go get water. If you're in a con, go do your bio break. If we are here on the table, I am muting a server. We are going to do a quick five minute break. One, it lets people cool down because we, we're all human. When you get emotional and fired up or you're passionate about something, whatever, it's very easy um, to not say and do things that you would normally do or that you actually mean. Um, And for people who are not, like I'm hyper-confrontational, for people who are not hyper-confrontational or or, or just shy away from confrontation, aren't comfortable with it, especially when you're dealing with issues of inclusivity, taking that break and then talking to that player privately is a really big help. I had to do that once at Origins. Um, I was at my wits end and I could see the table was starting to do that emotional wave. I was like, ah, we're gonna call a break right now. It wasn't an appropriate time. It wasn't a cool cliffhanger. It wasn't even like, ah, break right now. I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. And I pulled that player over to the side like, hey, here's where you are. Here's where we are. And here's what you're doing. Your options at this point are I can refund your money, give you your ticket back. You can go back down to registration and get your four bucks back. uh, Or you can correct this behavior. Yes. Here's where we are. What do you want to do? Yeah, great. That's a great point. Unfortunately, by the time we came back, um, two things that I observed there. One, by calling a hard break when things got tense, all the players at the table, to uh, men's point, knew that I did something. I, I, my silence wasn't complicit into the BS that was going around. They knew I did something. They may not have heard it. They may not have seen the conversation, but they know I, I pulled out the rug for a reason. So at least they know that they have an ally or a defender or somebody in their court. 
Um, and that was very helpful. I had a couple of players come to me afterwards. They're like, hey, thanks. I was like, yeah, no, I felt it too. Uh, and the second thing is, I really wish I just kicked that player off the table. Um, he sat there and brooded emotionally the last three hours of the game. Was not communicative, wouldn't speak to me, wouldn't speak to the other players, was completely shut down. That wasn't no. enjoyable for him. That was awkward for me. But you know what? That BS line of conversation that he was going, at least that got cut off. Yeah, right. So hard pauses, especially if you're not confrontational, a hard pause is great. Get everyone away from the emotion, get everyone away from the scene, get everyone away from the chaos. And then you can approach people individually or just let people settle down and constantly doing temperature checks. Y'all okay? Everybody good? I like I know calling them temperature checks too. That's oh. really, that's really great wording for that. And I hope you don't mind if I end up borrowing that for my games because I like it a lot. Hey, listen, I stole it from a therapy session. So steal it. <laughs> it is great. Because it, it is. It's a, it's, it's a temperature check. It's an emotional temperature check. Like we're, we're dealing with a situation that uh, is dealing with racism and we're here and things. Hey, y'all are role playing the hell out of the scene, but is everybody okay? Okay. Right. All right. Keep role playing the hell out of the scene. Do your thing. That's funny. I wondered if you had gotten that from therapy. I'm trauma informed trained from previous work. And I was like, that's, that's trauma language. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yep. Straight out of therapy. Hey, how's your temperature today? Well, um, and actually going off on what Bridget said with that, with the pauses, I've used Kiwi as a storyteller. When mm -hmm. I needed to pause a scene, I have put that pause and I have used Kiwi specifically to do it so that players know this is serious. And also by seeing me use it, I've seen players be more willing to use it as well. Yes. So by using, by using the same safety tools, I can say, I'm human. I'm not okay with this. We need a pause. Absolutely. Right. Like, yeah, lead by example. Yeah, we are, we are not immune either from having our own stuff or from making mistakes. Yep. Um, that's the other thing is exactly. we as storytellers, we have an obligation when we make a mistake, when we accidentally do something or say something that's not inclusive because it can happen or accidentally build something into a story without thinking about it. Like we're not being intentional. We're not trying to hurt anybody, but it can happen, especially yeah. in the kind of work that I know several of us here do around horror, around trauma. Like we, we, you know, play with, we interact with intense stuff. And mm -hmm. sometimes we're going to cause some problems. It is so important that we as people, we as storytellers say, I screwed that up and I am sorry. The words I'm sorry coming from somebody who has authority and power in the situation can be so important. Yes, it, baby, it, speak it, that. It gives other folks the ability to say, I messed up too. It makes you, it makes you approachable. You feel seen. Yeah. Like we were saying before, like Bridget said for inclusivity, that everyone feels seen. Mm -hmm. If you are in a place of power and you offer a true, honest, not begrudging apology, that players see that players know that and players remember that. Right. And well, it and has I think an you're impact really, going forward. Yeah, you're truly leading by example there because it's not like, well, I'm demanding that my players behave in a certain way, you know, and I'm always right. Well, we're all human. So we make mistakes. And sometimes like Megan was saying that, you know, you might build something into a scenario that you don't realize is problematic until the moment arrives. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's. That's not great. And I know as a, as a convention staff, we try very hard to always, when those situations come up and somebody is being a problem, you know, we wanna make sure that we're, we take care of it, the issue, and that we're sensitive to it. And that code of conduct is important, not only to our GMs and to our players, but to, ourselves as staff you know and I, I remember having some uncomfortable conversations when situations came up and amongst the staff it was like well I don't really understand why that's a problem and I'm like oh honey it's a big problem we're talking you know consent we're talking being inclusive 
we have to lead by example. I don't care if you think it's okay between you and your friends. It's not okay in this situation. I'm being kind of vague on purpose because I don't want to call anybody out, but. No, it's um, okay, Trish. I'm comfortable with saying that that situation was me. And the fact that the convention staff was willing to listen and be there to protect me, that means the world to me. And that is why Mepicon is my home. Mepicon is my family because you protected me. And I have no qualms with saying that. I appreciate the fact that you were being oblique on my behalf, but I own what's happened to me and I have no problems with saying it. And I appreciate the fact that you were as considerate as you were. Well, I love you. <laughs> you know, I like Trisha. So, so it, I, but that's been a difficult thing for me. You know, I've, I've not necessarily always been great about conflict, you know, but boy, you learn something. And what I've learned in that is standing up for what's right is a good kind of conflict to have. And that's okay. Right. And we all have different ways, you know, Bridget's, I love the break thing because you're calm, you know, let, let's take lower the temperature in the room. I love that. Um, and, but sometimes you, you have to have a, a straight up conversation with somebody and it might mean like Bridget, you know, is talking about a player that comes back to the table and he's not happy. I say he, they're not happy. Um, you know, but that's so important for all the other players at that table that you really took, took what was going on seriously. Thanks baby. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, going off of that with a more serious incident, um, that ties right into this with, uh, what to do when things go wrong. There have been two incidents that I have had to do as a storyteller for in-person LARPs. Both have dealt with physical contact that was against the guidelines of the game. And one of which was actually done to me where a player got so overly enthusiastic that he physically scratched my arm and left a welt. It was at a completely different convention, not Mepicon. Um, but it was before I had really developed an ability to assert myself, to feel confident enough in my abilities as a storyteller and as a game master, to be able to stand up and say no, like I had mentioned before. And I had had only one other player with me, femme presenting. And the player had gone back into the main part of the game. I was shaken badly. And she actually was the one who comforted me and asked if I was all right. And sometimes it's the players that end up helping the storytellers. But from that point on, we modified how we say our rules and made it absolutely explicitly clear that contact without consent is not allowed within our games. And I put that more firm tone of voice when I have to say those rules. And then the secondary incident was there was consent that absolutely was involved with the contact between several players, but somebody got dropped on their head because they were doing a very oh, no. not smart stunt because they were college kids. Now, granted, they were all friends. They all trusted one another, but it still was a thing of safety. And I only caught it at the end after um, said person was dropped on their head at a, one of our uh, times at running gag. And I'm like, okay, now we have to add, even if there's consent, there is to be no lifting of any humans at any point within our games. And there's people give some- Y'all don't be stupid. I mean yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because even if consent's involved, sometimes you have to put a more firm line because safety matters. Safety first. Yes, yeah. absolutely with that. So- there's two different sides to this story about, you know, dealing with modifying a rule. Sometimes you need to have those rules at your table to keep your players safe, whether it's from negative things like the first story or positive, but funny, but really not good things <laughs> like the 
story of someone getting dropped on their head in one of my games. Great point. So that's also something that's very important to think about that besides those pauses, you also have to think about safety. And if you have to completely stop the scenario right then and there because of an issue, you do it because that's what you do in the name of safety. Right. And your con organizers, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I understand how liability works. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I, I've said this to one of my friends that um, runs games occasionally. If something happens to you and you're uncomfortable to go to staff or whatever, I will go for you and I'll be the, the, your, your cleric mom and I'll go help you. You know, Even if I'm in the middle of my own game, I'll go and help you. Oh, yeah. I love it. So. It's just a tr trying to get people over that hump and in, instigate, in, you know, respect their own boundaries for themselves. Yeah. 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 And that's great that you're, that you're able and willing to do that, Jasmine, because there are a lot of people that, you know, again, many of us are conflict averse for many variety of reasons. And that feels scary, you know, it is scary. And, and I, that's why it's so important to me, you know, as senior staff, if we have volunteers or people, people that are new, mm -hmm. I always just tell when we're going over co code of conduct stuff, and sometimes the volunteers or newer staff get this like deer in the headlights look like, oh no, I'm gonna have to com confront some jerk. And I'm like, if this happens, just come get me. Mm -hmm. Just come get me. I don't mind being the bad guy in this scenario. Mm -hmm. it's and actually, Actually, Trisha, I said that once. Why didn't Why didn't you go get Trisha? Oh well, I I was afraid that Trisha was busy, so I I didn't want to bother her. It's like, well, it's important if, if they're bothering you and they're bothering the other players. It's important to go talk to staff. Absolutely, never too busy for that. That is way more important. I mean, this whole conversation, um, from my I guess, and this is kind of I know we have to wrap up soon, so I guess this is my wrap up. But for me, if folks listening to me uh, and listening to us only took one thing away from this whole thing. Um, to that point, I as a storyteller am telling anyone else out there who's a storyteller, this is your responsibility. As a storyteller, you put yourself in this position of power and responsibility. You made yourself an ally just by putting the little STGM whatever after your name on the chat, <laughs> on your badge, on your shirt. When you put staff on there, you've taken on the mantle and the responsibility of not just creating a culture of inclusivity, but of maintaining that culture. You don't get it. You don't get to have it be someone else's problem. You don't get to have it be someone else's deal. You don't get to ignore it because it's not affecting you or because it might disrupt your game. Like it's you now. Every one of us in this position has to step in and step up and be willing to say, this is not okay and this is not working. Whatever, whatever your games look like, whatever inclusivity is to you, it's your job right now as a storyteller, as a, you know, as a person in authority to help make sure that happens. Boom, end of it. That's it, that's for me. That's <laughs> then- um, That's a if, great mic drop though. Yeah, yeah it, it sure absolutely is. is. That was a bomb <laughs> mic drop. <laughs> and Going right off of what Megan said for my wrap up to add on to what she said to take away as a storyteller, your job is to facilitate your players stories and part of facilitating your players stories means making sure that they're included and represented. And it's may not be the way that you thought the plot would go. It may not be the story that you thought it would be at the start. But if your players felt included, felt safe, felt happy, and they were able to take away a beautiful memory of that game that they can treasure, then you as a storyteller have done your job well. And that is what I strive to do every single time I put my fingers on the keys or I am in front of a camera or I am in front of a mic. And that is the biggest takeaway added that I could add to what Megan said.
Woohoo. I just did know what they just said. <laughs> How about you, Bridget? Do you have any closing thoughts? I mean, after that mic drop that Megan just dropped, no, <laughs> geez. <laughs> um, I think closing thoughts when we're dealing with inclusivity to not repeat the awesomeness that has already been stated. Uh, we as storytellers, keepers, GMs, whatever you want to call yourself today are providing a service. We're providing a service to the players at the table. So uh, just like Megan said, it puts you in a position of responsibility to make sure that everyone is okay, that everyone is attended to, and that everyone is having a good time. And I think if we can approach keeping storytelling, GME, from the perspective of that we are providing a service to other humans, I hate to say it, but at the baseline, you should get most of this stuff right. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to drop the ball. Things are going to come up and things are going to happen. But if you're looking across the table and go, I don't care what their political views are. I don't care what their sexuality is. I don't care how I feel about any of these things. They are human beings that are trusting me to come and tell and provide a, tell a good story and provide a service. Approach them as human beings, guys. Uh, approach people as human beings. And I think you can skip a lot of the drama and the same thing, if something goes down, defend them like you would defend family because when they're sitting at the table, those are your kids. Yeah. Yes. Great point. Kids, cats, animals, whatever you want to put. All in. of them. Yep. Those are yours. Yep. That's your boy. My players. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Right. There, there's been often that I have dropped the, you're one of my players now. That means that I'm going to make sure that I do everything in my power to make sure you're happy and safe. Period. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's our goal at, at Mepicon. You know, our goal is that everybody comes out of this having had a great time and been safe and goes home with those great stories. And I mean, some selfishly, hopefully you bring back your friends next time, but, but we're not, if everyone is not safe and come away happy with their gaming experiences, then we've not done our job, you know, Thanks. we've not, added to the world which is what we're trying to do facts yes absolutely all right folks i so much appreciate your time today and everybody's patience while i was messing around with the technology over here so i appreciate you all and hopefully we'll talk again soon thanks for yeah. having us thank yep. you very much again trish for thanks having for us being here thanks y'all Thank you so much.